What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Universal Mastery. Welcome back to my public YouTube channel. Glad to have you here. So what exactly am I going to be speaking about in this today's video? I am really going to be taking you through step by step the exact order that we go through deep occult initiation in. What exactly does this order look like? Why are we following this structure? Why do we follow this order? What exactly does it mean to be an initiated occultist who through this process of initiation literally becomes a professional occultist? Someone who becomes very skilled with the art form. I'm literally gonna be taking you through the structure of some of the most influential, powerful, most known occult orders that exist, you know, on planet Earth today, just to name a few, Freemasonry, the Golden Dawn, Rosicrucians, Knights Templars. This is just the name of a few of them. I'm breaking down the structure of initiation that anyone truly can go through. You do not need to be in an occult order to go through this system of initiation. And I'm going to be really breaking this down and explaining this in this today's video for anyone that's interested, really taking you from square one of where you need to start and why you need to start there and how we work our way up getting into the deeper levels of real spiritual occult initiation, which does directly connect back to the Kabbalistic tree, okay? This is coming from someone who is a professional occultist, who has been through the system myself. So this is the space that I am communicating this information from. If this is something that you are interested in, definitely consider staying tuned for the rest of the video, and I will simply see you on the other side. All right, let me first start with introducing myself just in case you do not know who I am. My name is Jeremiah Schwartz. I'm a professional occultist. I'm fully initiated in the entirety of the Kabbalistic tree. I'm studied when it comes to the 22 major arcana of the tarot deck. I'm studied when it comes to planetary energies in association with astrology. And I'm also studied when it comes to trauma in its relation with the nervous system. All right, so with that being said, now you understand who I am. So let's go ahead and let's get into this. So we're talking about the order of initiation and what exactly this looks like. I'm even going to share some secrets, some occult secrets on how to trigger some of these initiations into your life. I want to first start by saying this, though. If any of you are really serious about your occult initiatory journey, if you're someone that's really trying to become a real occultist and work with spirituality and metaphysics at a much deeper level, then what I would highly recommend is you checking out my Patreon. Because on my Patreon, I really do focus on a lot of techniques and a lot of practices that can start triggering some of these initiations. And I break them down in a very practical way so that you can understand, understand them. And I give you a lot of education on what we're doing and why we're doing it. So all of that and just an entire wealth of knowledge is going to be on my Patreon. So I would start there if you're someone who gets, you know, if you're someone who's interested in doing this type of work, especially if you're watch, if you came across this video and you're feeling like you're in resonance with it, definitely consider checking out my Patreon. That's going to be the first link in the YouTube description. All right. Just wanted to start with that. So as I said, I'm even going to be sharing some, some of the knowledge the occult knowledge on how to trigger some of these uh, experiences, some of these what we call initiations in your actual life. So just be aware that this is real deal stuff that I'm breaking it, breaking down. A lot of this is occult knowledge, which means it's hidden. A lot of this stuff is very powerful. Um, it it can when you when you actually do start to work with it, it can trigger some significant shifts in your physical life and in your body, which also is followed by spiritual shifts and things of that nature. So just be aware that this is no joke. This is not stuff you want to play around with. You want to make sure that you have a solid foundation before really diving into this type of work. 
Once again, I would also recommend booking a mentorship with me if you are getting into initiation so you can have a guide through that process that understands it. That would be the second link in my YouTube description. But ultimately, I am going to be sharing everything you truly need to know to understand this process and what it really does look like. And I do want you to know that there are many people that you don't know that are into this type of work. So when it comes to the Illuminati, when it comes to, once again, occult orders, like people that are involved very heavily with Freemasonry, the Golden Dawn, the o the o nine eight, like all these different types of orders, right? And there's many more. A lot of them are working with this system of initiation and they are using these metaphysical sciences and these technologies to trigger serious levels of self-development, which does imply changes to the genetic changes to the genetic code, changes to the DNA, changes to the cellular functions within the body. And obviously with that energetic shifts as well, energy body changes. So take this for what it's worth. Don't play around with this as if it's a joke because it's not. This is real deal stuff. And just make sure that you have that awareness, okay? And I once again, what I was really trying to nail in the coffin is that this is real deal occult initiation here. This is like what a lot of A-list celebrities are using. This is what a lot of like celebrities in general are using. This is what a lot of just powerful people in general are using. So a lot of entertainers use this because they use this type of technology in their entertainment field, like music videos, TV shows, movies, etc. But then there's a lot of other people like government officials, politicians, presidents, uh, a whole host of people, people that are not a part of the government, right? Then we have military specialists, you know, like a whole host of powerful people use this type of technology, not saying that everyone that uses it, uses it with the right intention. And actually a lot of people that do use it, well, I'll, I'll go as far as saying this, anyone that uses this technology with the wrong intention ends up actually hurting themselves even more later down the road, because that's just how the cycle functions. That's the nature of karma, cause and effect. And I've seen it happen firsthand to many people. I've experienced it in myself as well. It's real. But the people that have the right intention, that work with the system of initiation, literally become the most powerful people on the planet. Because you're, you're basically connecting all levels of the self together. Mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. Just completely bringing them together, getting a full awareness of of what all these things represent and triggering the processes of working with these parts of the self in the most deep and intimate way. All right, so where do we start? So the very beginning starting points for occult initiation starts with developing a foundation. It always starts there. You have to develop a foundation. Now, this piece that I'm adding in right now this foundation piece, this is a piece that actually a lot of occult orders, a lot of people that, you know, teach this system of initiation do not necessarily require their students to learn. There are a lot of people that do work with this system. I'll even, I'll hold it up. This is the, the Kabbalistic tree. This is the system of initiation. A lot of people work with it, but they do not teach the foundation. They, and, and, and basically what the foundation is, is this is developing a safety net for the practitioner, for the student to know how to get in tune with their body sensations, to know how to start feeling their emotions to process and to know how to have healthy, we could almost say routines and healthy habits and healthy relationships in their life to make sure that they have a safety net that becomes the foundation. All right, so working on that foundational level is the first piece that needs to be implemented and needs to really be understood before getting into the actual initiations of the tree itself, before getting into that. And, you know, there's a lot of ancient cultures that actually understood this process intuitively. So there's many traditions where the student or the person 
wasn't able to learn the deeper mysteries of initiation until they reached a certain age. Um, so that is something that is pretty common in, in other traditions and other cultures. Uh, and that is simply because of this principle that I'm talking about when it comes to having a foundation. So if you're too young, it's probably more likely that your foundation isn't fully developed. So that's why you're not able to initiate or learn those mysteries of the deeper level initiations until you get older. All right. So, but regardless, I mean, just because you're young doesn't mean that you might not have a solid foundation. You could technically be young and have a pretty solid foundation. Uh, and then there could be someone who's older, like literally 40 years old and have no foundation whatsoever. So it's not just about age, but the principle there that I was referring to is that foundational principle. That's why certain traditions and certain cultures don't teach um, people the deeper level mysteries until they know that they're ready. So there are many people that do understand the necessary, excuse me, the necessity of a foundation. But I, from what I've observed in w the Western culture over here in America, I'm in North America, and there are also many other places as well where the foundation is not understood. So there are a lot of occult orders, there are a lot of spiritual teachers that will teach their students exactly what their students say they want to learn, which is oftentimes the initiatory process. How do I get into initiations? How do I trigger the process? And that's fine. You can do that. It is what it is. At the end of the day, there are going to be people that run with that and grow. But then there are going to be a lot of people that do not know how to process those energies. They're going to trigger massive amounts of uh, self-development. They're going to trigger massive amounts of uh, emotions to start coming through the nervous system, uh, to rise up to the surface. And if the student doesn't know how to process that, it is most likely going to leave them more traumatized than when they even started, which basically means in a nutshell, their life is going to go to shit. And I have seen it happen firsthand in my own life because I've initiated this Kabbalistic tree in my own life. And because I had good intentions and strong intentions, I worked my way through it and I came out on the other side with a lot of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and awareness. But I went through a lot of pain and suffering that I didn't necessarily have to go through had I had a proper foundation in place before my initiations. So I experienced it in my own life. I've seen, I've been the person who has actually taught people how to initiate into this Kabbalistic tree um, right out the gate because obviously this stuff is attractive it draws a lot of people in. Usually it draws people in that are very traumatized and they want to know the keys of initiation. They want to start developing. I get it. it. Makes sense. I was no different. But a lot of these people do not have the capacity to process. And I have given people the keys to initiation many times and I have seen people hurt themselves in that process and become so much more traumatized. And ultimately, that's not what I want at all. If, if you're learning from me, if you're studying from me, I want the best for you. Regardless, I want the best for anyone who's getting into this work because that's what it's about. It's about self-development and integration. So it's it just really, over time, it started to rub me the wrong way where it was like, why is it that some people, or I should say like this, why is it that so many people are failing in these occult initiations and becoming more traumatized and just getting more stuck in life, whereas some people are really running with it, developing their awareness, gaining tons of knowledge, and their lives are shifting in a very healthy way. I couldn't, for a long time, I couldn't understand the difference as to what was the missing piece there. And what it really came down to, I found the answer, and I, I lived the answer, is it all came down to the foundation. Like having a healthy underlying safety net within yourself, within your body, having a connection to the human experience, knowing how to feel your emotions, knowing how to shift negative coping mechanisms in your life to healthy coping mechanisms instead, um, getting out of toxic relationships, spending more time with the self to process and to build a relationship between the self and the inner child, developing general education of trauma to understand how trauma 
does absolutely play a role in our self-development and spiritual self-development. So all of these different things that I'm talking about here are the foundation and making sure all of this is addressed, making sure it's in place, making sure we have experience with it. This is how we solidify our foundation and create this internal safety net so that when we get into the, the real occult initiation, this occult initiation is going to trigger massive amounts of repressed negative energies that have been stored in the body from past trauma all the way back to our childhood and even in past life incarnations. Yes, it does get that serious. And when we start triggering these energies to come up to the surface, which comes with, um, as I said, I, I even said it, memories. So we're going to have visions. We're going to have memories resurface to our consciousness from times we, we went through trauma, from times we went through hard situations, rough circumstances, times in your life where you literally felt like you could have died probably, right? That type of stuff. So there's going to be memories there that come to the surface that you haven't probably experienced in a long time. There's going to, there's at times there's going to be nightmares that you start having that seem like really scary, terrifying, weird nightmares. And, you know, to the average person, this is like, what's happening to me? I don't like this. I don't want to go through this anymore. To the educated person that has a foundation, oh, I understand this is a part of the process. And the nightmares I'm having are a part of me processing those repressed emotions because the repressed emotions are generating the nightmares at night so that you can do, I mean, we could literally call it astral processing, astral shadow work, astral trauma work. So that is why we want the foundation and that is what happens when we do get into this initiatory process. There is going to be a lot of tough things that get triggered and have to come to the surface. So I'm what I'm really trying to do is harp on the foundation, okay? I really need this to sink in because it's that important. But let's also go into some of the benefits to initiation. So initiation is working through each of these Kabbalistic spheres one by one. All right, so we have Malkuth, Yesod, Hod, Netzach, Tifereth, Gavura, Chesed, the hidden sphere of death, Bina, Chokma, and Kether. And every single one of these spheres is representing a different planetary energy. And there is different levels of awareness, different levels of consciousness, different sensations, different emotions that we experience in every single one of these spheres that generally are in relation to the planetary energy that the spheres are represented by. So all of us exist within Malkuth, every single one of us. This is like our baseline because we're human beings. You could think of Malkuth as being earth. And earth is the five senses, taste, touch, smell, see, hear, and it's things that are physical and material. So we all exist in Malkuth but we all also have a soul and a spirit. And the soul and the spirit is going to exist largely in the sphere of Kether, which has to do with the crown, and then beyond, which goes into the void, the limitless all, the infinite light. So that would be the Ain, Ain, Sof, Ain, Sofer. All right? And that soul and that spirit comes down through the tree. Okay? shoots. It basically shoots down. If we're looking at it from like a Kabbalistic perspective, the soul and the spirit shoots down from Kether. So it comes down from the void, limitless all. It comes into infinite light, shoots down through the crown, and then goes like a lightning bolt from Chokma, Bina, Chesed, Gavura, Tifereth, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and then right down to Mount Kuth. So it's like showing how the energy comes down from the heavens or from the astral plane, from the void, from the infinite, all the source, and shoots down our bodies in a lightning bolt fashion. Literally, you can think of a lightning bolt, how lightning bolts strike from the sky. There's actually a similar correspondence to how that energy sort of comes down into our bodies. Um, in every single one of these planets, we have energy centers in our body, 
and energetic locations of resonance to every one of these planets. So every one of these spheres, you could think of it as working on a different part of our own DNA, our own genetic code, as well as different cellular functions. So if you haven't noticed by now, this entire Kabbalistic tree literally is in the shape of a DNA strand. And that's for a reason, because we're working with our own DNA while we're going through these initiations. And what happens is we work from the bottom. So the way that the spheres are labeled is this is sphere number one, and then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's kind of how the energy flows down from the source. So that's basically us coming from that void or coming from that astral plane or the source down into the physical incarnation. And that's how we look at it from that order. But then when we initiate, we're actually going back to the source in regards to our awareness. We're, we're starting to travel back to where we actually came from to develop that awareness of our deepest, deepest roots of being which is in that void space, in that source space, that astral space. So when we initiate, we're actually leaving physical plane, we're leaving earth, and we're starting to travel up the tree from 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, back to the source awareness, back to the realization, wow, we are actually all truly connected together. And there's a big difference from someone who says, oh, I get it. We're all connected together. The source is real. God is the infinite all. There's a big difference from someone who just says that because they read it from somebody or they learned it from somebody between someone who's actually experienced the state of being that it actually feels like when you're in that level of consciousness. There's a big difference. And it does take a lot of integration, a lot of processing, and a lot of self-awareness to work your way up to that point where your body has the capacity to enter into that state of being where you really do feel like everything is truly connected. So I, I say that just so that you can have the awareness. There's a big difference. There's a lot of people walking around in our today's time that say these things like, oh yeah, we're all connected. I get it. We're all the source. You know, we're all God. We're all infinite. All like everything. There's few people that are walking around that actually are living in that state of being that truly understand it and understand it because they've felt it they've experienced it all right so with that being said that's how we travel through that's how we travel sphere by sphere up the tree and every one of these spheres that we're entering into as i said we're working with a different part of our own genetic code dna cellular functions and that's coming with real life experiences like real life physical circumstances are manifesting because we're going through pretty significant shifts internally between these spheres so in other words mercury in the sphere of hod when we work with it when we when we know how to trigger it through ritual and we initiate into it Mercury becomes our actual life experience. This sphere of hold, splendor, Mercury becomes a physical life experience. And we start feeling and becoming more influenced by literally the energy of Mercury in our local galaxy, in our solar system. Mercury starts influencing us because we're basically opening up on that higher dimensional level to connect with that planetary sphere and pull in its energetic influence. And what I want you all to know, listening to, is every one of these energies on this tree, every planet here, and every energy in general, we're all experiencing these right now. None of us are separated from any of these energies. They're always at play within our bodies at all times. Um, so when I say, like, when we work with Mercury, it's not that we're just shutting out everything else. We're still connected to the entire tree. The whole tree is our DNA. Like, this is us. We are the whole tree in, in its totality. But when we're initiating with the sphere of Mercury, we're getting a heightened experience, a more intensified experience of that portion of our consciousness and of our body and of our mind and of our uh, emotions and all that other stuff. So with that intensified experience, we get to sort of polarize what this sphere represents in the universe on planet Earth, and most importantly, in ourself. And it 
as we polarize it, we're further intensifying it and we develop it. We can integrate it more effectively in our body. We can process it more effectively. So it's like, you can imagine you're trying to learn how to ride. There's the, like, you have a scooter, you have a bike and you have a skateboard. So we could make an example like, this is the skateboard, this is the bike, this is the scooter. It's like, if we want to master something, if I want to be, if I want to really understand how to ride a skateboard, then I'm going to spend more time riding the skateboard or whichever one I said was a skateboard. I'm going to spend more time riding the skateboard. I'm going to polarize the skateboard so that I can become a master of it or so that I can gain some sort of mastery over it so that I can work with it and understand it and make the mistakes that I need to make with it. I need to fall a couple times. I need to try to do tricks and see if I'm good at it and see if I fail at it and keep course correcting. Whereas if I'm trying to learn how to skateboard and bike and scooter all at the same time, it's going to be harder. It's going to take a longer time to, to master one of those different crafts rather than if I had just focused on one of them and spent more time and energy polarizing skating over, over the bike or over the scooter. So this is the analogy I'm trying to give. That's what we're doing with this tree. We're polarizing these basically energy centers in our body, working with it, understanding what it means in ourself, what it represents, what it triggers, but also what it represents in our environments on planet Earth and in the universe itself. So that's one way of how we initiate. We, and when I, I guess what I want to say is that's how we initiate. That's how we travel through the tree. Now, the way that we travel though is through the archetypes. So we actually have to start with initiating the opening of the sphere. And there are ways to do that. And I'll, I'll touch on that. And then we also want to call on the opening of the archetype that is connected between the sphere that generally brings us into the next sphere. So this process is not linear by any means. So there's not a one way to only do this. There's many ways to work with this structure. As you can see, there's many different paths here, many different archetypes that can go in different directions. But generally what I like to do is I like to open up the sphere, initiate the opening of the sphere, and then I like to call on the specific archetype that starts to move into the next sphere. So I can sort of initiate that travel from one sphere to the next. And, and I like to work with it in an ordered fashion. So 10 to 9, Mal, uh, Malkuth to Yesod. So I would open up the sphere of Malkuth. Then I would open up the archetype of the world, which is this pathway right here. And then that in itself is going to give me the energetic experience of what Malkuth represents, what the physical plane is all about. It's going to polarize that in my awareness, help me work with it better, help me process it better. And then it's going to give me an experience of what the energies of the world represents. So the archetypes I tend to find, they for sure, all of these different spiritual phenomena are going to manifest physically. They are going to show up in the physical plane, but they are very much internal experiences as well. Like that's the main, that's the, the main bulk of this initiatory journey is understanding the self and the self's connection to everything else. So for like, for example, there's some spiritual teachings and traditions that say the spheres are more so objective manifestations and then the archetypes are subjective. So I guess they would say the spheres as you work with them become external manifestations. Things change according to the sphere and the planetary energy it's governed by. And then when you work with the archetype, it's, it's, like more of just a complete internal experience of like what that archetype means internally. And I do like, I do like that breakdown. I think that is accurate, but let's also make sure we are aware that it's not just that linear and it's not just that black and white. These spheres, yes, are going to represent physical changes in your actual reality, depending on which one we're moving into, but they're also going to affect you internally too. You're going to feel the energies internally.
It's not just going to be external. And same with the archetypes. They are going to be heightened with internal awareness. They're going to they're going to trigger internal awareness to be uh, to be basically orchestrated around what that archetype means. So with the world archetype, this is largely associated with letting go of physical attachments. This is like stepping through the portal of the womb, the universal womb of like surrender, letting go, trust in the process, and having to kind of go through that tough, that tough time of like letting go of things that you really don't want to let go of. That's like the world archetype. It's kind of like letting go of your attachments to the physical plane and starting to open up to things that are unseen, things that are you don't know. Really actually being open to the unknown. And that's what that represents as. But that also, as that is a very deep internal experience, that also manifests externally as well. So there are literally physical things that start to ship according to that world archetype because we're letting go of physical experiences. So that's a part of that archetype. So that would be like, okay, I'm letting go of this toxic relationship. I'm letting go of this substance abuse. I'm letting go of this job that I hate in order to start this initiatory journey, right? So that's how that could look and that could manifest. Now, once that's been opened or once that's been initiated, then the soul can travel into naturally the next sphere, which is Yasod. So then we start working with Yasod. And we can also like, so this is like, this is really what I want to communicate. As I'm breaking this down in the way that I'm breaking it down, this is not black and white. This is not linear. This, this is a very universal tree that can be worked with in many different ways. So the way that I'm breaking it down to you now is the occultist's way of working with this Kabbalistic structure. This is how most of us as occultists that have this education, have this knowledge, this is how most of us work with this because we know how to trigger these spiritual experiences consciously. We have the knowledge, we have the tools to trigger these experiences. But there are also many ways to work with this entire tree. So let me give you an example. You could open up this sphere here of Malkuth, and then you could open up this sphere over here of Netzach. And your soul and your spirit could start traveling into that sphere and have that experience and potentially miss, you know, skip this one. Okay? So it it is depending on sort of what your willpower is and what you're focusing on. Like if you're like, okay, I want to work over here and then I want to go over here and then want to go here and you trigger it through ritual, like you're doing conscious triggering of this process, then you can access those different energy centers in yourself sort of prematurely because I like to work with it in order because the order is there for a reason. It's structured in such a way that it helps balance out the body and gets us prepared for the deeper experiences. So that's why I like to work with it the way I do. So if someone's not like if someone is another occultist, they can work with it in that way and trigger that that experience, jumping spheres, basically. Now, you don't need to be an occultist to work with this tree. This is what blows a lot of people's mind. They're like, what? How do how do you know? How does that make sense? I I thought this is the ancient knowledge. Remember what I said. This is us, every one of us, whether you're into spirituality, whether you're into the occult or not. We are the tree itself. This is our bodies. This is our energy field. It's our bodies. It's everything to do with human beings and who we are. So we are the tree. So you don't even need to be an occultist to go through spiritual initiation and self-development. Literally, spiritual initiation, occult initiation is literally spiritual self-development. That's all it is. It's the only real difference is the occultist is working with it on a usually a much deeper level. We're, we're working with it in a much more intensified way. So with ritualistic triggering of these different spheres, we're, we're really polarizing these energy centers. So we get a more intensified, heightened experience of what they represent. And we can work with that and study it and process it in that way. But the average person, everyone... I should have said that every single person is working with this tree in some way. 
depending on your intentions, depending on what you're doing in life. Like, are you letting go of things? Are you stuck? Are you attached to certain things? You know, we're all part of this tree. So there are many people that are, you know, in different areas of this tree or spending a lot of time usually in the lower portions of this tree. So most of humanity is just sitting in Malkuth. Most people haven't even gone through that first gate. So as you can see, there's actually like a gate here, which is called the veil of the profane. And most people have not crossed that veil. So most of humanity is basically just locked into the physical plane where that's all they believe is real, what they can see, what they can taste, touch, smells, all that other stuff. That's all that's real for them. And that's just what that is. Now, there are people that start to open up their awareness and they start to have experiences that are spiritual and start to allow themselves to step into the unknown. They start to sacrifice certain things. Like they start realizing, look, this job isn't working with me. I'm going to let go of this job or I'm in this crazy relationship that doesn't make me feel good. I'm going to let go. And that can start naturally moving someone through this structure. And the way that the soul will naturally move through this structure when someone hasn't been through it before so like just naturally in someone's incarnation is it will move in order. It will move in a balanced way. So the average soul will naturally, based on the person's intention and what they're doing in the physical plane, will move them through this naturally, just like this. But once again, as a cultist, <clears throat> we, we have a little bit more power to choose what it is that we're trying to access, but that power can sometimes turn into something that hurts us in the long run. So once again, as an occultist, you could start studying all this and maybe because you're already an occultist, maybe naturally you've already actually initiated through some of this tree already. Maybe let's say, for example, you've been existing in the sphere of Tiferath. So you're, you're working a lot with the sun energy within yourself, working a lot with your personality, working a lot with your higher self. This also represents the ego. So people's egos can get inflated during the sphere as well. And let's say that you are already naturally there. Maybe you didn't even know you were naturally there. And then you start studying the tree. And because you're already pulling on these heightened energies of the sun, which oftentimes can expand the ego, it also expands the awareness. So that could lead to why the person's even studying the tree in the first place. Uh, it connects deeper to the higher self. So you can have a stronger connection to that and sort of have that telepathic communication really come online or a stronger intuition, things of that nature. But let's say that they were studying this tree. They're naturally here. They don't even really understand they're here though. And they start saying to themselves, okay, I've, I'm studying Netzach. I'm studying death. I want knowledge. I want to know my true self. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to try opening up this sphere. I'm going to work with Netzach. All right. I'm going to open that up. Boom. Start opening up Negazak, have a pretty cool experience, you feel good, start bringing in those Venusian energies, love, harmony, abundance, attraction, all that stuff. You start kind of flowing with it, start realizing that Venus nature within yourself. And then you're like, okay, well, that was really cool. Like, I can't believe that I just opened that sphere and had this crazy experience trigger in my body and also trigger in my physical reality. Let me go right to death. Let me go and develop this higher level knowledge. Let me start crossing the abyss. I'm ready to do it. And because the person is using occult technology to open up these energy centers, they can literally open up these energy centers before they're actually ready to process it so that they can jump to open up an energy center before they even have the proper capacity to process what it is that they're working with. So that same person can end up initiating the crossing of the abyss, but they still haven't necessarily had the experience within Gavura yet to, de to, to develop inner strength, to understand how to express healthy aggression, to learn how to let go of triggers. And then they haven't experienced the natural mercy in the universe to show that all things end up do balancing out. Even when people, you know, potentially have bad intentions towards you, when people seemingly take advantage of you, everything balances back out and the universe shows you that. So if this person hasn't had that experience with Gavura and hasn't experienced the mercy of the universe, when they go into the crossing of the abyss and they start surfacing up all that stuff that was buried in their nervous system from their trauma and their past and even past lives, 
they don't have the, they probably do not have the strength to go through that. And they're not going to know the nature of the universe is always there to work with them and, and protect them. So this can traumatize this person during this experience to the point where they literally start leaning heavily on really unhealthy patterns in their life on what I like to call unhealthy coping mechanisms, toxic relationships, drugs, addictions, all kinds of that stuff. And then their life goes to shit. And they literally like, they just get put in a position within themselves where they're so afraid and they just do not know how to, how to function. They don't have any awareness on how to process it. They're they're basically stuck in a fight, flight, or freeze mode of always trying to run away from their emotions. Yet they triggered this deep emotional process of initiation and they simply weren't ready for it. So what I'm trying to show is some of the benefits that we have as occultists when we can use our knowledge and our power to access different energy centers on the tree and in our body, but that same knowledge needs to be used with responsibility or else you can fuck yourself up with it. All right. So once again, going back to what I was saying from the very jump, I needed to say what I said there, but back to this. So we're working from Malkuth going to the top of the tree. And as an occultist, I can trigger the opening of this Malkuth and then the archetype of the world which connects right into that next sphere. And then I can sit with that. I can give myself like a month. I could give myself two weeks. I can sit with that energy. I can process it. I can pay attention to what I'm feeling, what my sensations are, what's happening in my environment. Then when I start feeling like, okay, I think I've processed enough of this energy. Now I can go into the next one. I can do a ritualistic process to open up the energies of Yasod. And then I can work on this archetype here and open up the archetype of the sun. And I can sit with that energy for an extended period of time, two weeks, a month, two months, three months, however long you intuitively feel you want to sit with that until you've processed it. And oftentimes the intuition will tell you. Then, okay, I feel like I'm ready to move on. I'm going to open up the sphere of hold and then I'm going to open up the archetype of the tower, right? So this one might take a little bit longer to process because this is typically a, a pretty challenging experience on the tree because we're dealing with the mind on the negative pillar, which the mind is already like a masculine energy, but the negative pillar is a feminine. So that usually requires having to die to beliefs, uh, mindsets, things in that nature, certain thoughts. And the tower is the essence of breaking things down. We have to break down the old to create space for the new. So whatever part of our being that is um, preventing us from understanding our own feminine nature, preventing us from fully just being able to let go, trust the process, feel the emotions. That's what gets torn down in this archetypal experience of the tower. So that might take us two, three months to go through to process fully. Whereas maybe this one took like two weeks or a month. So it just all depends. And then once we feel like we've gone through it, once we feel like we're ready, then we can open up this sphere and we could follow the same formula and the same pattern going through the entire tree. Now, once again, it's not a linear process. So if I'm in the sphere of Ho, let's say, I don't just have to necessarily work with the archetype of the tower. I could also open up this archetype right here too. So this is the archetype of the devil. So if I want to get a deeper experience and work with a different part of my own psyche, a different part of my emotional body, my mental body, and my physical body, if I want to develop a new awareness which will turn into my power, then I can work with this archetype of the devil as well while I'm still in the sphere of Hod. And I can do the exact same thing for this sphere too, or this archetype, I mean, right here. So this would be the archetype of, uh, is that justice, I believe? No, that's the hangman. So I could work with the hangman right here. And I can choose. I can use a specific ritual formula to open up these different archetypes and have these experiences. And when I'm working, let's say, for example, I'm working on the devil archetype, I am going to be getting a little bit of this energy here from the, the center sphere of the sun. So I'm going to be pulling some of that into my energy field, some of that into my awareness too. Whereas if I do this one, 
I'm going to be pulling down a little bit of that Mars energy, right? That Mars energy is going to help initiate that hanged man experience in my life to give me a better perspective of what that represents in my personal life with the way that my life is structured and what I'm going through and what I'm feeling. And all of these are going to be challenging. These archetypes specifically, these are really tough ones. They're going to be hard. They're going to bring up a lot of stuff that we need to, to, to process and we need to face and we need to learn about. We need to observe and let go. But ultimately, they are going to lead to our wisdom, our understanding, our knowledge, and ultimately our power. All of this helps us better understand our true nature, which really is the true self, because we are the source, every single one of us. And this is just another way that we can work with it. So this formula goes throughout the entire tree, all right? And just on a side note, this is the tree of life, referred to as the Sephiroth. And as we flip it, this would be considered the Klipoth. So we can almost look at it like this is the aspect of ourself that has a lot more positive associations with it. Um... It's almost like it shows a lot of, that's what I'll say. I'll say it's the more positive aspects of spiritual self-development. It shows us the nature of the true self very clearly, shows us very clearly the nature of the source. Whereas when we start to work with the clip-off, this is just, this is just as important as the Sephiroth, very valuable, super and deeply transformative, but it's showing us sort of like the opposite of what the source is. And it's showing us sort of like the opposite of what the true self-expression is as we're initiating through it. It's showing us the, the areas and the parts of ourself that we've fragmented and that we've had to become in order to survive a lot of the traumas that we've been through in our life. And one thing that I always like to say is the more we work with something, the more we're actually learning about its opposite. So when we actually start to work with the clip off, although we're diving into deep demonic work here and we're going into our own deepest levels of internal negative energy, negative emotions, trauma, we are actually in this level of initiation learning the most about the nature of the source and the nature of our true self because in order to experience the true light of your own source nature, you have to go into the darkness to start cleaning out some of the things that are lodged in you that you don't fully understand. So when you start going into your own darkness, you start to realize the more, the deeper you go into it, it's not wrong, it's not bad, and it's not evil. And it never was. It was placed there or it was set up in your life for you to go through those things so that you could know more about your true self, know more about the nature of the universe and how things all truly do interconnect together. So there's a lot of beauty in the clip off, but it's, it is one of the hardest forms of spiritual self-development and occult initiation because of the nature of what you have to start processing and working with inside of yourself. But one thing that I have for sure come to find with my years of working with this stuff is that when we start really diving into the clip off and working with it, as long as we know what we're doing, as long as we have a foundation, and I would highly recommend having a guide through this process like myself, you know, with, with someone who's been through it before that can help you navigate, the deeper we go into this, the higher we experience this the true, the positive aspects of our nature, the positive aspects of our emotional, physical, mental states of being, spiritual states of being. So I have found a direct connection to that. So when people only work with the Sephiroth, they tend to not have the most intimate or deep connections to the positive aspects of their own being. They can gain a lot of awareness, they can gain a lot of knowledge, and they can they can make progress by knowing what that true self-expression is and understanding the nature of the universe and how the source operates. But until you go into the clip off and you start diving into those negative repressed emotions from all your past traumas, until you start working with the demons to 
you know, process the energies that they bring into your life and into your body so that you can basically transmute them into what they actually are, which is power and potential and awareness and knowing and, you know, the true self reclaiming your own, you know, reclaiming your own behaviors that you had to shove down from the trauma you went through in your past. So in this clipothic work, that's what we're doing. We're working with the deepest parts of our own darkness to reintegrate them, feel them, and process them. And as we do that, naturally, we are gaining we are gaining much more access to higher levels of intensity of this Sephirothic side. So remember, this is the 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 this is the yang and this is the yin. Okay, so the yin yang symbol, this is the yin, the clip off, this is the yang. We're not separated. So when we when truly when we are initiating through the Sephiroth, we are working with the clip off as well. Because you can't separate the trees. Remember, all of it's interconnected at once, at all times, but we can polarize the experiences. We we can intensify the different aspects of this tree and ourself using occult technologies of initiation and ritual work to get a better awareness and a more intensified experience with this level of initiation. And that's what's taking place. So for example, when you're working through the clip off, you're, you're still going to experience the tree of life energies, but you're for sure, as we go deeper into this clip offic tree, we are getting so much more of an intensified experience with our own negative energy and with once again it really does all connect back to our past traumas and repressed emotions from those past traumas which show up in many ways and we can start working with them even through the projection of spirits and entities and things in that nature which becomes a phenomenal way to work with our own darkness like we can actually work with it we don't have to be afraid of it so like a lot of demons can come through the energy of our own trauma. They can literally come through those negative emotions that we have stored in our body and they project through that emotional resonance where we can work with them. We don't have to run from them. We don't have to be afraid of them. We don't have to think they're evil because they're not. And they can actually teach us using that emotional resonance that's stored in our body that then helps us to pull it out, bring it to the surface and eventually let go of it. And then that demon becomes, you know, a guide for us. It becomes a part of us where that that demon originally was almost like a part of ourself that we were afraid of and that in a way was starting to operate on us uncon unconsciously because we were allowing that to happen. And as we externalize this demonic force, through the energetic resonance of our repressed emotion, the negative emotion from the trauma, we can work with that emotion through the archetype of the demon or through the manifestation of the demon. And we're learning from it. And as we process it and let it go, we, we literally become what that demon represents. So every demon represents certain levels of power, potential, knowledge, awareness, it's a certain level of consciousness and we become that once we've processed the trauma that it was related to. Whereas previously it was unconsciously operating on us because we've been running away from it, calling it evil or saying that's not good or I don't want to feel you. So hopefully you can follow what I'm saying. And we do that through the whole initiatory process of clip initiation. And the deeper we're going into this, the more we're rising and intensifying our experience with the positive aspects of nature and life and ourself. Okay. So when it comes to the Klebothic initiation, so as I was saying, the archetypes here for the Sephiroth are going to be the generalized 22 major arcana of the tarot deck. So we have the world, we have the moon, we have judgment, we have the sun, we have, um, the star, we have the tower, the devil, the death card, justice, hangman, hermits, uh, emperor. Which one is this? 
We have strength right here. What is this one? Let me see. Lovers. We have the lovers, the empress, the um, fool, and then the magician. So that's the Sephiroth, and that's how we work with it. And we will generally use the tarot deck to, to help us trigger those initiations. So, for example, here's the judgment card. So I could use this tarot card to help trigger that pathway to open up. Here's the moon card. I could use the moon card to help trigger that pathway to open up. And et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we're working with the clip off, we are using a different set of archetypes. You could use the regular archetypes if you wanted to. See, once again, ritualistic work, occult work is very creative and it's very dynamic. There's not just a one way to do this. So if anyone ever makes you think or tricks you into, tricks you into making you believe like their way is the only way, they're full of shits. And just know that in the back of your mind. Be careful with those types of people. But we could work with this archetype on the Sephiroth. And if we wanted to flip it for the clip off, we could flip it upside down. That could be an unconscious representation of how we're accessing that clip offic realm in the spiritual world, in the spiritual dimension. And it can trigger that. But I find the most, for sure, the most powerful way to work with the archetypes in the clip off is going to be through this tree right here which gives all these different specialized archetypal representations to what's known as the tunnels of set. So these would be the archetypes within the clipothic tree. So once again, as we flip this, that's what the archetypes would be. But here we have them in the book and they are named different things. So we have Baratriel, Amproteus, Dagdagil, Gargophius, Tempioth, Parfaxites, etc., etc., etc. And this is the book called The Night Side of Eden by Kenneth Grant, right here. And in this book, he provides sigils for every one of these paths. So as you can see, this is the Amproteus path, and that's one of the sigils right there for Amproteus. And it even tells you like what you can put on it to um, connect with it. So like I'll just read the first page. The 11th path or Kala is attributed to the element air and its negative aspect is the demon or shadow known as Apro Amproteus, whose sigil is here given and whose number is 401. So all that information right there can be added to the ritual to help us further connect with this archetype. This shadow may be evoked by vibrating the name Amproteus in the key of E. Okay, so that's a way that we can invoke Amproteus. And remember, this is just Kenneth Grant's way of working with this. There are other ways to work with it as well. I find there are much more simple ways to do it where we can literally draw out the sigil and then create our own invocation calling on Amproteus to open up, okay, and to, to come into our life so that we can have the experience. It's that simple. Uh, he also goes into saying the sigil should be painted in lumi lum luminous pale yellow on a square ground of emerald flecked with gold. So these are powerful ways to link into this energy. Once again, there are much more simple ways to do it as well. If you can't get your hands on, you know, a square ground of el emerald flecked with gold. And cool. All right, so that is that. Now, let's go into some of what else you need to know. So, how, what can I share with you to give you like a little bit of a perspective of how we could open up some of these initiatory doors on that spiritual level? Because what I've done so far is I've broken it down. I shared with you the real occult knowledge of how initiation takes place and what it looks like when we're initiating through it. This is real level, this is real high level occult knowledge that I'm sharing with you. So if you're enjoying this and you appreciate that I'm sharing this publicly, hit the thumbs up and definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel. And once again, definitely consider checking out my Patreon for some of the deeper level content, which will go into some of the ways and practices that you can open up these spheres in very much depth. And it also gives you a lot more education on what they represent and things of that nature. But generally speaking, if we are wanting to, let's say, 
open up the sphere of Malkuth to work with it and to get... Well, no, we'll, we'll not do Malkuth because Malkuth is Earth for the most part. And we all, we all for the most part, have a pretty solid awareness of Earth and the five senses. So let me use Yasod as an example. So if we were to ritualistically try to open up the sphere of Yasod, what we would want to do is we would want to get a flashcard and we would want to draw a circle on that flashcard. We would want to write Yasod on it. Y-E-S-O-D. And typically we're going to want to write this in purple. And the reason why is because the sphere of Yasod is purple. And that's going to connect us to the sphere. Then we're going to want to write the number 9 on the flashcard as well. And then we're going to want to draw a little moon on the flashcard. So we have this little flashcard. All this is drawn in purple. It says Yasod on it. It has the number 9. And there's also a moon on it. Very cool. So once that's done, then what we're going to do is we're going to get another piece of paper and we're going to write out our own statement that is going to be turned into an N. So an N is basically like a chant or mantra, something that we say repetitively that is basically us stating our intention to the higher part of ourself and to the universe itself. And we're... The way that I like to do it actually is I like to write the N in a different language than the language that I speak. So I like to refer to Latin just because it's a really easy language to use. And there's a lot of ancient connections to Latin as well for this type of ritual work. So I will translate from English to Latin a statement that is me stating my intention of exactly what it is that I'm trying to do. So I, Jeremiah Schwartz am opening the sphere of Yasod so that I can initiate into it and gain the awareness that I need to gain to integrate my true self. I command this to happen right now. So I will take that exact statement that I just said in English, I will translate it into Latin, and I will write it on that piece of paper, and I'm going to put... A number next to it so I'm gonna put times 11 and basically what that means is I'm gonna say that statement 11 times and the reason why I like using the number 11 to say these types of statements is because 11 is a number that connects us to to death energy and that's because 11 on the Kabbalistic tree is the 11th hidden sphere which is death and death represents death energy which represents transition it represents change so whenever there's death, there's movements, spiritual movements. So from it's the death of one thing and the birth of a new thing. So we're trying to pull up that same energy from dying to the old self to move into the new, the new experience, the new chapter, the new initiation. So that's why we're, we're saying the um, statement 11 times. And why am I changing it from English to Latin? Because I don't want to get my conscious mind too involved with the statement. So when I'm reading over the N, I don't want to be too consciously aware of exactly what I'm saying because I don't want to be too in my mind. I want to be in the act and in the emotion and in the feeling of saying the statement. So as I'm reading the N in Latin, I, I don't know how to read Latin. So it's coming out in a way where I'm tuning more into my emotions and I'm tuning more into uh, my intention rather than the language that I speak in English. If I write it out in English, I'm paying more attention to every word and what the words mean. So this is literally why I like to change the language that I'm using to read it off. So if you speak Latin, if that's a language you, you are fluent with, then I would change it to a different language. And you can really do your own research and choose which language you want to use, which, whichever one resonates with you the most. Um, so that is why I changed the language. And then once that's finished, I'm also going to get another piece of paper, or I could do it on the same piece of paper, and I'm going to create an invocation of this specific entity or spirit or angel that rules that specific sphere. So I'm going to be invoking the intelligence that governs or has a lot of resonance with that specific energy center in my own body and in uh, our solar system. 
So in this case, Yesod on the Sephiroth is highly connected to the Archangel Gabriel. So I'm going to create a separate invocation of Archangel Gabriel that's going to fall on the lines of, I call on Archangel Gabriel to open up the sphere of Yesod for me so that I can experience it and integrate everything that it has to teach me so that I can become more in alignment with my true self. So I'd write something along those lines. And then it would be followed by, I call on Archangel uh, Gabriel. I call on Archangel Gabriel. Archangel Gabriel, come to me. Archangel Gabriel, come to me. And that's what I would create. So at this point, I have the little flashcard with Yasod on it, the moon, the number nine. Then I have a separate piece of paper with my statement written out in Latin. And then I have the invocation of Gabriel. So at this point, now that we're gonna, now that we have all the tools we need, or the the papers, I should say, the bulk of the ritual, that's li literally the most important part. Now I'm gonna create my space in such a way that I can really go through that I can I'm gonna create my space in such a way that I can really make this an actual ritual itself. I'm gonna make this resonate with very deep portions of my own unconscious and subconscious. And obviously with where I'm at as an occultist, I understand a lot what these symbols mean. But if I didn't understand what the symbols mean, they're still going to have a lot of power because we're working with it on an unconscious level. And that's what really matters. Just having the symbolism there is giving us resonance to certain types of energies and symbols and archetypes. So what I'm going to do as an occultist is I'm going to set a crystal circle. I like to use quartz crystals. Once again, you can be creative with your magic, but this is what I like to do. Quartz crystals are very powerful. They have a lot of like secret technology that are embedded within them that a lot of people do not understand. There's something about quartz in general that are super powerful. They can really store psychic energies. They operate as these, really, I mean, they operate as these stones that just can streamline, you know, spiritual energies beyond what I, beyond what any other, beyond any other stone that I know. So something about them is super powerful. Um, and we have a lot of quartz crystalline structures in our own body. So it resonates uh, very deeply to a large portion of our own energetic makeup. So I like to use, you know, choose your amount somewhere around 11, 22, 44, you know, whatever resonates the most. I like to use either the number 11 or 22 for the most part. 34 is another number. That's that's one that I teach. I've taught on my Patreon. But it's really up to you. What, what are you resonating with? I like to use like 22. I'll use 22 as an example. 22 quartz crystals. Create them in a circle around myself. And I sit in the center of it. And what this is representing to me is that I'm sitting in the source. I am in the source. I'm in that source energy. And then all of those little quartz crystals are playing energetic. They are influencing me energetically as well. All right. Then what I, what I generally am going to want to have as well is I would prefer to have uh, nine candles. If I can get nine purple candles, that's going to be perfect. And that's really going to connect me with the energy of Yasod and whatever that energy represents in my body, which truly represents a foundational energy. So I would prefer to have nine purple candles because this is the ninth sphere on the Kabbalistic tree. And then when I would go to light the candles, what I would do actually is I would put those candles just outside my circle and then I would light them in a, um, a clockwise format. And I'm doing that just because I'm representing the clockwise direction as sort of adding to my body, adding to the experience. I find that clockwise energies are more like adding into, whereas counterclockwise is more um, subtracting, taking away, building up versus destruction or breaking down. And with that, um, that is generally enough. You know, with the papers we have, with the, the circle that we're sitting in and then the candles, that in itself is enough. Now, you could add other things if you want. If you want to make it even more energetically charged, you could print out a picture of the moon if you want. You could 
have a five pointed star like a penta um a pentagram you could um you know have different candles as well you could have a white candle you could have a black candle and you could assign them different representation the white one consciousness black one unconscious you know there's a lot of different things that you could add into this you could add the four elements um you know the pentacle uh the wand the sword the cup you could add those in if you want to add that just that extra flair of the the elements in the, the whole process the tarot card, um, that's another one that we could definitely tap into uh, when it comes to the archetype, the path that we're going to be connecting on. I'll, I'll touch on that in a second, but generally, the things that I already stated are what are pretty much the most significant things to connect us to this energy. Then I'm going to sit in the circle after I light all those candles. Um, you know, once again, we could add incense sticks. That's actually a good one. I would like to add that. A specific incense stick that you resonate with. I tend to find that dragon's blood is a really good incense stick universally. Okay, there's something about that dragon, that serpent energy that just resonates with, it's, it has a very powerful resonance with a lot of different things and causes things to kind of, causes energy to be in movement, change to happen. So I find that's a good one. Um, and yeah, once again, adding in some extra stuff, we could add like a skull. Like if you have access to a skull, like a fake skull, doesn't it obviously doesn't have to be a real skull. If you have a real like animal skull, that's something something that represents death can also be helpful to create that energy of transition. So these are just extra things that we could add in. But once that's done, you know, I light all the candles. I'm sitting in the circle. I have my papers. Um, I read over the ritual itself, um, which is the state. Or first thing I'm going to actually start with is I'm going to start with the invocation of Archangel Gabriel. That's the first thing I'm going to start with after everything's lit. All the candles are lit. And once I read over that invocation, then I'm going to go over the actual ritual itself, the statements that I have. Um, so at that point, I'm commanding the sphere to open up. Then I'm going to basically have that other little flashcard of Yasod, and I'm just going to gaze at it for a little bit. Okay, so once I did the invocation, once I said the ritual, I'm going to gaze at that little flashcard, kind of like energetically connect with it. I'm going to feel into my emotions and see if it brings anything up out of me. And once I feel like I've done that, then I'm just going to kind of sit in my space. I'm going to sit in the circle. I'm going to be with myself. I'm going to feel my body sensations. Once again, feel the emotions and just be in that present moment. And then just let what happens need to, you know, let whatever happens happen and just sit there. And once I feel like, because at this point, there are several different things that could happen. You can, I mean, you, there's a multitude of different experiences that can take place after you've gone through this whole process and now you're just sitting in your circle. So I can't I can't tell you like this is exactly what's going to happen next. This is exactly what we're going to control. This is what we're doing next. Just sit with the energy, see what comes up, see what experiences you have, see if anything triggers, see if you are noticing a shift in energy, see if certain memories come up to the surface. Once again, are there any sensations in your body you're starting to feel? Are you getting any telepathic communications? Is your intuition getting heightened? Paying attention to those things. And once everything's done, then I'm going to blow all the candles out. And typically I'm going to blow it out in a counterclockwise way. So I lit it in a clockwise, then I'll blow it out in a counter. And then I'm going to burn that little flashcard with the Yasod on it, with the moon on it, and with the uh, number nine on it. I'm going to burn it. And then I'm going to burn the other papers as well. I'm going to burn the invocation and the statement, the ritual statement. And once it's all burned, it's done. Okay, everything is done. It's set in stone. Then I can close up shop, go about my day, and I can pay attention to see how things shift and if anything triggered. Okay, so with that being said, Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, my camera is literally about to die. This is a really long video. That's why. I'm going to have to wrap it up here. This is, once again, very advanced information on occult initiation and how you can actually trigger this process, which a lot of people don't know and a lot of people aren't teaching. Um, it goes way deeper. It gets way more nuanced. This is what I'm releasing to the public. As I said, it goes much deeper. It gets much more nuanced. It gets way more intense, especially when we start looking at the clip-off and the tunnels of sets. That's what I specialize in. That's my favorite. 
that's what I work with. So I don't even actually really work with people on the tree of life aspect. Uh, the, the Sephiroth aspect, I prefer working with the Kliboth just because there's so much more deeper work to be done there and so much more um, knowledge that needs to be gained with that side of spiritual self-development and evolution. And that's what I'm interested in. So if any of this resonates with you and you want to get into this work, I would recommend booking a mentorship with me at the second link and becoming a part of the Patreon. Join the Patreon. If this intrigues you, if this is stuff you're interested in, join the Patreon. Look at the vault of knowledge that I have there and let it really soak in. And then obviously you can reach out to me or you can book, excuse me, you can book with me if that's something you want to go deeper with. I'm going to have to wrap it up right here. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have an amazing rest of the day or night, wherever you are. And I will catch you in the next video. Peace.